All right, um, modifying metals. So how we play around with metals and make them into the things that we kind of want, really. Because um, when you get a metal, it's not always, it doesn't have exactly the properties that you want it to um, display. Um, things like iron and um, things like that, it's a hard metal, but sometimes it doesn't work in the way that you want it to work. So what we need to do is we need to modify it in some way. And this podcast is going to go through the ways in which you can modify metals. So let's go have a look at this then. Okay, the first way um, in modifying metals is to play around with alloys. Alloys come in two different ways. We have interstitial alloys, which are up top here, and we have substitutional alloys. Okay, alloys contain um, a metal with something else added to it, an impurity, if you will. Okay, the interstitial ones basically have two or more different metal or diff different atoms of different sizes. Here we've got um, steel, which is iron and carbon. Iron is a relatively large atom because it, obviously it's got a lot of um, it's got a pretty big amount of protons and neutrons, and it's got a rather large amount of shells. Okay, and then carbon is a smaller atom, and it kind of fits in between it. This is known as your interstitial. Okay, these guys. Okay change the property of the metal to make it um, a bit better for use. Iron by itself is pretty hard, however, it's not. Um, it's still quite malleable it's, and if you heat it up it will melt quite easily. When you add carbon to it and turn it into an alloy, it changes the properties and makes it even harder and it's um, a stronger metal. It kind of does this, if you can imagine trying to move these um, these atoms around a bit in the lattice. Without the carbon here, these guys can move quite easily. But as soon as you put something in there, it kind of blocks it, kind of locks it in sh into shape, so it makes it harder to be moved around. So your interstitial alloys generally um, make your your metal a lot harder and um, a bit stronger. So steel is a stronger version of iron because it has this carbon kind of put into place with it, and this is an interstitial alloy. Substitutional alloys are a bit different because they've got two or more different atoms of a similar size. Take, for instance, your, your copper and zinc in bronze here. So copper and zinc are right next to each other pretty much on the periodic table, so they have a pretty similar atomic radius. So what we've done here is basically substituted one of the coppers or a few of the coppers for zincs, and this creates a different type of alloy. Substitutional alloys have similar properties, just a little bit different. You might have more, um, you might be able to have stronger um, links between the two um, different types of metals, or you might have weaker links between the two different metals. Depending on what property you want out of your um, your material, you'll depends on what you'll actually use. So if you want it to be a stronger material, you'll choose two elements which have a stronger interaction between the two. If you want it to be a weaker metal and have a lower melting point, things like solder and stuff like that, you'll get two metals which have a weaker interaction between the two of them. So substitutional alloys are ones that have two or more atoms of this similar size. And alloys in themselves, they're basically just um, metals which have been modified to give you a property or a certain property that you want a, um, a better characteristic out of it. So you might start with a metal and it doesn't do exactly what you want it to do. If you alloy it up and um, alloy it with another metal, you might get a more of a desirable property. So that's, that's alloys, the first type of modifying metals. The next I've got a bit of a video as well. So next here is heat treatment. Heat treatment is all about lattice size, crystal size. Um, as you know, the crystals um, or the atoms in a metal, they're in a, um, a lattice form, so they're basically in rows. The crystal size kind of tells you what's going to happen with the metal and a bit of the properties. And you can have two different sizes. You can have large sizes or a small size. Let's have a look at um, this heat treatment. So what I've got is a bit of a bobby pin, a hairpin. What I'm going to do is turn on my gas tap um, and I'm going to heat that up and heat it really, really high. What's happening when I'm heating it, okay, is the atoms 
are going to become more loosely packed. Obviously, it's burning for a little bit because I've got a bit of plastic on the end there. But as I heat it up, the atoms become loosely packed and they start to be able to move around a bit. I can do a few things once it's heated up. I can quench it, which basically cools it down really quickly. Okay, So I've heated up, and if I quench it and cool it down really quickly, what's going to happen is our crystals are going to form and they're going to be of a really small size. The smaller size crystals basically mean it's harder for it to move around. Okay, There we are, quenching it, putting it into the water and cooling it down very quickly. What's happening here is I get a small crystal size and you can notice that the bobby pin snaps very, very easily. Okay, Quenching heating up past a critical temperature where you get that loosening of the um, metal atoms and then cooling it quickly gives you a small crystal size. What this does, quenching, it actually makes the, the metal a lot more brittle. Okay, So it, it takes the metal that was quite bendy as you saw it at the start of the video there and now it's really brittle because it's, you've got a smaller crystal size there. Okay. So we're going to continue on with our um, thing, and we're going to do the next part, which is annealing. Annealing is the opposite of quenching. So you're heating it up, and then you're going to cool it down slowly. Okay? So what I'll do here in a second is do that. What's happening when I heat it up past a critical temperature? Once again, the atoms, they, they um, loosen up a bit. Okay? So here I am, heating it up again. Um, and then I will cool it down slowly. So when it's heating up, those atoms are loosening up. They're um, getting a bit more free to move around, and they're, they're just kind of like wobbling around, basically like melting it, but melting it just below the point of um, its melting point. So turn it off and let it cool down slowly. When it cools down slowly, the atoms have more chance to kind of come around into the, the crystal um, structure that we want it to have. Okay? By cooling it down slowly, we get a large crystal size, which allows you to bend it a bit more. So when you anneal something, you're heating it up past a critical temperature, cooling it slowly, you get a large crystal size, and it actually becomes a bit more flexible, a bit more malleable. And in a second, you can see, yep, it's a lot more malleable. It's not breaking. I can actually bend it around quite easily. So annealing gives me a large crystal size and allows me to bend it a bit easier. The last one, which I haven't got here, is called tempering. And tempering is basically um, heating up to a set temperature and cooling it relatively slowly. Okay, A bit faster than the other one. Okay, But you get a medium crystal size and it basically gives you a strength to the um, metal, but it also gives you that flexible property as well. So rather than being like annealing and it's really, really bendy, when you temper something, it has a strength to it, but it's not that brittle strength as well. It's not brittle. It doesn't just break. So there are your three types of heat treatment. Um, quenching, where you get a brittle metal. Annealing, where you get a malleable, flexible, and soft metal. And then tempering, where you get a hard, but malleable metal. Okay, so tempering is probably the best one out of the three, really. So that's heat treatment. Moving on to the last one, which is about work hardening. Work hardening is where you're basically bending a metal back and forth, and this will make the metal more fragile. The re if you imagine this, like if you bend anything, any type of metal back and forth, you'll notice that after a while it will break in half. Okay. This actually happens because the metal crystals rearrange themselves until the part where they can no longer move around freely. And when they can no longer move around freely, what happens at the next point is it just snaps. So at the start, a metal might look like this with the metal crystals kind of a bit further away. By bending it back and forth, these can get closer and closer together. Every time you bend it back and forth, the metal crystals get closer and closer together. After a while, you'll get a point like this where if we're bending it around, these have no more room to move. So when you try and bend it, 
what will happen is it will just snap down this line here. Okay, so the next time you bend it, it will snap. So work hardening is bending a metal back and forth and this makes the metal more fragile. It rearranges the crystals until they can no longer move. So you have this changing of the crystal um, spacing really and when you get to that point where you can no longer, the metal can't manage to move around and still be held by those delocalized electrons, it just snaps in half and that's work hardening. And that, my friends, is the end of modifying metals. You have alloys, you have heat treatment, and you have work hardening. I don't think I've got a summary. I do. Anyway, for the summary for both of these metal things, you should be able to do this. You should be able to draw a diagram of the metallic bonding model. You should be able to state and explain the properties of metals using this bonding model. So you need to explain um, the electrical conductivity, the malleability, okay? Why is a metal strong? You should be able to explain those three things at least with the bonding model. You need to be able to explain what an alloy is, okay? What the two types of alloys are and how they might be used. And then you might need to also explain, well, you will need to also explain what the three types of heat treatment are, as I said before, annealing, tempering, and quenching and what work hardening is and how that affects the properties of metals. And that, my friends, is it. All right, that's the summary. That's all you need to know. And if you didn't understand it, go back, watch the video again. Until next time, where we look at ionic bonding, I'll see you later.